Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so just I, I threw a, a quick little interactive question here. Um, would love to know in the chat if you want to drop it, what's the one thing that you want to learn today and where you're joining from? I'm assuming majority of the folks are going to be from DC, <laughs> granted the name, but who knows? It's a virtual event, so just curious. Um, if you, uh, what drew you to the event and what kind of things that you're interested in in NLP? If we have. Not a lot of participation yet, so <laughs> we're still grabbing the 6 p.m. coffee. I'll, I'll go to the next one. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, Artie and the team for um, letting me introduce this topic. Again, it's geared towards more individuals that are starting out, right? So this is just a very gentle introduction and it's going to kind of help you understand and disintegrate some of the terms rather than kind of dig into some of the more advanced analytics and NLP that is out there today. Cool. So what we'll do today in some form or fashion um, is first, I'm just gonna give you a quick little uh, snippet TLDR for what are the highlights, what are the takeaways from the session? Um, so that way you can kind of orient some of the topics that we'll cover. Then we're gonna, again, disambiguate what is NLP, and then we're gonna dig into and spend some time learning about some of the techniques that are uh, useful early on. Then we're gonna open uh, our and do some code examples. So <laughs> bear with me as we do that. And then we're going to pivot back to do some tips and outlook, um, wrap up with some questions. Awesome. Let me see if I can minimize this a little bit so I don't see the screen. Awesome. Here. So TLDR, um, NLP stands for natural language processing. So it's a component of artificial intelligence umbrella. And basically, it's kind of one of the components where we're trying to figure out the interactions between the human language, right, and the computers using that natural language. NLP is not just one thing, it's a suite of techniques. You're helping, it's helping us to draw insights from the text data, right? The other thing that I'll focus on is just with any type of application, it's really important to focus on your use case and your business, right? Define your problem, understand what constraints the business has before diving into to the solution. It doesn't only mean NLP, could be any type of analytical solution, but just make sure that you document them, watch for changes, and then you can kind of select your tool or select those techniques because some of them will be pre-filtered out for you depending on what the business needs. Then we'll also talk a little bit about data collection. It matters, right? The abstraction of the original information and how you ultimately, what is the data that you're going to be working with. And lastly, I'm very optimistic about the future. There's a lot of excitement in this space with uh, large language models. The one thing that I will just encourage everyone to do is go try them out, go try out NLP, go do one thing that, um, what, you know, that you find interesting. And it's super easy, it's accessible to everyone, right? Um, but it's one, one way for us to kind of like learn about the tools that are out there and understand how they're put together. So that way we can kind of make, make sure that we also understand the biases that exist and we continue to kind of make the uh, ecosystem fair and equitable for everyone and, and have fun. Cool. So a couple of things where NLP is used or things that you've already seen, right? Virtual assistants, Siri, Cortana, email, spam filters. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> it would be surprising to me if somebody doesn't use an email, um, but you know, uh, spam filter is a big one, right? Uh, if you look at the spam folder, you're probably likely very um, gra uh, grateful for the fact that you don't have to go through those to get to the emails that are important to you. Uh, customer service chats, they're becoming more and more frequent when almost all of the different platforms and uh, maybe like interactions and shopping, uh, you basically kind of interact with, with a technology first ahead of speaking to somebody. Auto suggestions and search and email, uh, the, the kind of the, the population of I'm gonna say hello and thank and then it kind of a pre-filter already pre-filters out or suggests the fact that you say, you wanna say you, because that's something that's followed by. And then the last one is just spelling, autocorrects, you know, translation, things like that. The sentence here is very, probably very easy for you to interpret what it means, but it's not as easy for like a, a computer to understand that unless it's spelled correctly. Cool. This is not necessarily something you have to throw in the chat, but I, throughout this presentation, 
it's helpful to kind of ground yourself in understanding how you process information in order for you to kind of like start applying some of these techniques and understand how you are going to then leverage these. So when we're talking through all of this, it's it's kind of an interesting to say like, how do you know when somebody's happy or confused or upset? Is it their language? Is it something they, they said? Is it something that you saw, right? How do you figure out how to get somebody for your birthday? This is kind of a little bit more ambiguous, but is it something that you heard? That, did, did they say something? Did they share some information with you? Have you ever been in a conversation where you didn't know what somebody meant? Hopefully that conversation is not now, <laughs> but we'll disambiguate a lot of these <laughs> terms. And then the last one is kind of like, when you get feedback, how do you figure out whether you apply it or not? And these are not necessarily, again, questions that we're gonna answer, it's just something to think about. Like how do you process information? And that information then draws you to make a decision. Right, so that's kind of the point of kind of disambiguating some of the text data, so we can get to that. Cool. So we'll dive into our first learning module, which is just definitional. Right, uh, we mentioned it. NLP, natural language processing. It's a branch. Right, there's there's a, a a lot of different techniques in there, but really how you should think about it is that there is a knowledge of the the human language, and there's a lot of languages that we have. So keep that in mind as well when you're leveraging different techniques. A lot of the times you may find that it was built for English, right? Or built for whoever's a developer, whoever use case uh, it's serving. And understanding that human language or what it's for may impact how your data is processed, right? Computer science is just essentially like how you process that data. That's how I think about it, right? That's the, the component of it. And then the branch of artificial intelligence is the insights that you put together to draw some of the decision-making process. So what is NLP in the grand scheme of things? There's a lot of these Venn diagrams out there. I like this one because it kind of encompasses a lot of it. Plus it puts NLP in both artificial intelligence and not. It's, in a, it's a suite of techniques, right? You hear kind of like the general AI term or this is an AI application, right? But within there, you have a lot of different components, not all uh, computer vision is gonna be, um, you know, deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, NLP. Some of those items are just kind of in the ecosystem and you can, as you get to apply different algorithms, you kind of cross the, the, the bridge between both of them. They can be both, right? But they don't have to be. They can be more rule-based and more um, analysis of some kind of hierarchy. So really what those, all of those items are geared towards is structuring some form of data and drawing some insights, whether that's generating more human language or text, um, including text and speech, or using computer algorithms and statistical models to, to draw some kind of conclusions, summarize text, chatbots that we talked about already. So those are kind of some of the applications that you can see already leveraged in your day-to-day -day life. And before we get into the most common terminology and most of the learning components is I mentioned that it's important for us to think about where the data comes from. And that's generally any type of data, right? Anytime you're working with something, it's an abstraction, right? Um, we generally think about, or I think about it as like written or spoken, spoken language. That's how we communicate um, through text. You're still typing something. I'm speaking to you right now and you're processing that information. And one of the um, key factors that is, that is really cool to think about is there's a little bit of variability on the percentages that I show here, I, I linked to the resource, but generally people believe that 55% of the communication is nonverbal. So if I'm kind of moving my hands and moving around, you're kind of picking up some of the clues that are not necessarily inherent, but you're still processing that information. You might be seeing my face and you're kind of registering the fact that I'm not sad, not overly happy. So those are all the communications that are also uh, shared with you. The 38% vocal is the type of uh, how, how quickly I'm speaking or the intonation of my voice. So if I just start speaking very slowly, or maybe I'll, I'll speak very quietly, or maybe I'll just switch how loud I say certain words, that might be some information that you'll process differently. And then lastly, it was really surprising to see that when it boils down only 7%, that's remaining is going to be words. So now you're like, 
you took all of this information that we use and then you distilled it to maybe like 7% and now you're working on a new driving site. So it's kind of good to, to keep in mind. Some of the ways, right, we can get text data or data that you're working with this video. Um, underneath there will be some form of audio. Um, you have, you can have like an image that has some form of textual representation, obviously text data. But again, it's just very important to understand where the data is coming from and how it's processed and then how it's stored. So just a, a general example, if you have information that is in a different language and English as an example, potentially you may translate the language that is not English into English. That is one abstraction where information can be lost, right? Some cultural context, things like that, that might be very nuanced, might not translate well. So then you have to take into consideration that that particular information may not be as accurate as something that you're doing in the other language, right? So that's what I mean by just make sure you kind of understand where the information is coming from, how it's stored, and then just what maybe has been removed. Or the other example could be if you're getting the information for like survey analysis or something like that, if you're only sending it to 5% of the individuals, and then your response back is 30% of that. Well, then not only did you not get 100% of your population, but then you also didn't get 100% response rate. So it's just really good to build context of what is there and what is not. Cool. Now, another interactive component, this is a little bit of uh, the first two bulletins are a little bit more you know, uh, US-based or uh, US-geared. Um, when you look at the first one, feel free if, if you want to drop in the chat, if you recognize what that pattern is, go ahead and drop it. Um, the second one should be pretty easy, but uh, that's one of those things that we, again, look at the pattern, we inherently understand what that is. The next ones that you can think about is, do the, the three items, your book is killer, they are on fire, the fire emoji, like would you consider those positive, right, if you saw them? And then the other ones, and again, pre prefacing the fact that I don't read Japanese, I use Google, Google Translate for this. So I'm hoping it says what I, what I think it is, something about uh, looking for customer service assistance, um, say similar with Spanish. So, but the question here is that when you see all of this, would you think that those are the same? Like, are, is that a complaint or is that a feedback on a similar issue, right? So those are some of the applications that you may see that you already notice the fact that there's not the same words used, right? Not even the same language. There's particularly even different ways to say the, the items in terms of blue moon, right? But maybe intuitively when you read it, you can say, yeah, these are all the same. I know what the issue is, right? We need to increase responsiveness. But it might not be as easy to translate that or understand how to uh, systematically apply that. And some of the NLP techniques that we'll cover today can, can help assist in some of these items. So you can kind of disambiguate some of this uh, information into usable and sets. Cool. So again, NLP techniques, there's a lot that we're not gonna cover today. This is more introductory, but I like the Venn diagram in many, many different applications on the left. I put a couple of stars on some things that are more applicable to today's session. But there's a lot of additional use cases and applications that you can kind of look through and um, understand that, that this is kind of like what it's used for. But the ones that we will focus more are introductory and we'll cover some terms that when you get into NLP, they'll be useful to understand, like know and familiarize yourself. And then we'll also integrate some of these into the, the workshop. So tokenization is one that we'll talk about, just breaking down the information into usable units. Named entity recognition is what it sounds like. There's certain words that we recognize and it's just that process of making that more systematic. Lemonization and stemming, which is the process again, to help disambiguate the information and um, make your problem space a little bit smaller. Stop words, I'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, regular expression, we'll touch a little bit on uh, sentiment analysis, and lastly, we'll go into topic modeling. Cool, so terminology continued. 
even with those aspects that I just mentioned, some other things that might be important or for you to think about, they're not necessarily uh, items that are widely used in every single um, application. But if you kind of run into a NLP uh, course or just kind of anything uh, uh, out there online and you're looking for um, ways to start, you might notice these. So I just wanted to cover them. A corpus sometimes is, is basically how I would think about it. It's just like, what is that bigger body of information that you want to process? So thinking about our example of the customer service, maybe it's just all of the customer service calls that you had in the last 30 days. Like that might be your corpus. And then when you jump, jump into the next level of granularity, those are kind of uh, documents, right? It's like, how do you want to segment your information? And that's how I think about it. It's like more of a, a unit of information that you want to process by itself. So maybe it's just one call, one interaction with somebody, or maybe something else that makes more business uh, case or business sense to you, right? And then the last one is like the next level of granularity is I would think about tokenization is that how you break down the document into um, parts of text that make the most sense for you to actually like iterate over and work through. That'll make a little bit more sense in the next slides. Cool. So NLP techniques, we'll start with sentence tokenization. Um, as I mentioned, right, tokenization is breaking down uh, the information into individual uh, components in this example it's sentences and I just threw an example out here um, that basically just gives you a little bit of a paragraph on Michelle Obama and then if you do sentence tokenization all we're, we're thinking about is just making sure that or breaking it down to that sentence component right so if I want to look at the whole entire paragraph and do some kind of analysis maybe it makes more intuitive sense for me to do that analysis on each sentence to then figure out okay well maybe they're switching topics Maybe they they have some relationship between one and two, and that is a choice, right? You don't necessarily have to do it, but you can. The next one is word tokenization, and you can have multiple words, one word. You can even have a window that is not really intuitive. It's not a word. It's just like a the first fifteen characters or every fifteen characters. But specifically, a lot of the introductory uh, techniques leverage words. Um, and word tokenization really is just what it is. You're taking that sentence or the paragraph and you're just dividing it by every single word. It's it's useful again, but sometimes it's a little bit more intuitive when you're thinking about how to uh, read or summarize something. You're kind of thinking about what are the words that are present and then you draw conclusions from that. The next one is named entity recognition. So an example of this, um, it's, a, it's basically a subclass of information extraction. And what it does is when you're, when you're looking at this example and you intuitively may already know that January is a, is a month, 17 is a number, maybe it's a date, uh, 1964 is a year. So those are the things that are processing, right? In, in, in your head, potentially Chicago, Illinois might be a place and then Princeton and Harvard may be either a place or they may be a university, however you want to think about it, but you're like categorizing those items and you're, you're understanding that those are uh, entities that mean something else as well. So they kind of have dual meaning. And named entity recognition also helps with breaking it down to parts of the sentence as well. So you have your verbs and your nouns and your adjectives. This can also help because then it intuitively understands, okay, well, she maybe is a noun, and then therefore I wanna understand all of the different nouns, like who, what is the subject of your uh, paragraph or body of text or document. And then maybe it's more about the verbs, right? Like what is happening? So then you can kind of just th think about it in your use case and then apply it um, in, a, in a way that would help you disambiguate or make the problem space a little bit smaller. Cool. Lemmatization and stemming is a, is a really fun one. When I first started, this was a really cool find. And I'm in the, I like lemmatization a lot more. I found it more useful, but stemming also has its place. So for me, um, both of them are a way for you to basically, again, a lot of these techniques are just making the problem space smaller in a way that things that you may see are the same or 
the programming uh, component of it or for systematically for it to also see it the same, right? So like if you just think about it like um, space it takes to store graduate versus graduating, right? That's like a longer word, therefore it's inherently different. And what this does is basically just says, hey, what is the lowest unit of that word that we can think about? And then basically apply it that way. That's just kind of like how I think about it. Um, and a lot of the time, so for these two examples, the differences that um, I found for limitation and stemming is largely one of them is um, I, you a little bit maybe lose like readability, right? So in a limitization aspect of it, you would see something where like was will become be graduate, graduating. Um, but in the stemming, and there's a couple of different stemmers. So if you do get into this and you want to try it out, you can um, read about the different types of stemming, like how does it actually think about um, changing the endings of the word to basically make it more uh, systematic, right? So graduate will become graduated, was become D, but then in the second example, um, having will be just HAV, which is not as readable. So you potentially may be losing a little bit of read readability. The other one that is really cool is stop words. And the stop words are generally just filler words. So as you're listening to me and there's a lot of information that is shared, you may be filtering out a lot of the words that connect the sentence together, but you're still able to get the information that you need. An example of that is she was born on January um, in Chicago, Illinois and graduated from so those items may not be exactly filler words, but you could think about them as if you just read it without the highlighted text, you can still understand what is happening in the sentence. And stop words, when you're going to apply some of the early techniques, especially topic, topic modeling, it could be beneficial for you to filter them out because the readability of your topics may pick up on the words that appear quite often, but are not necessarily something that adds a lot of information. The other thing that was pretty interesting is that stop words can give you that flexibility to adjust your data and kind of have that lever for yourself to integrate some of the words that are maybe more specific to your use case. And in that regard, you can leverage the stop words that are um, already prepackaged in, in a lot of the, the packages, but you can also create your own. And I'll show you an example as well. Regular expressions. I provided a link here for kind of regular expression generator. Um, some people get really good at it and can define the patterns um, and like basically create something very, very nuanced um, to work with text. But really, regular expressions is a way for you to. Um, set a, like share a set of instructions on what pattern to remove, extract, something like that from the text, right? And there's a lot of different characters um, that you can uh, put in the, in the form to basically say like, I wanna remove all punctuation or I wanna remove all uh, fifth letters or I want to extract the pattern. So um, like we saw before in the two prior slides where you have the phone number or you want to remove something that looks like a, an identification for a phone call, right? So those, those items are a little bit more flexibility for you to remove items. And it just gives you a little bit more, you can, you can include it in the stop words, but this gives you more of a pattern flexibility rather than just focusing on something that is like word specific. And, and here, um, through regular expressions and working with just strings, sentences, or anything that you put in there, is generally something where it already understands every single character and then kind of categorizes that into what other components can that character represent. As an example, like a space is something that's understood that those are spaces, dashes, um, a period, and then it might interpret them all as punctuation, as an example, or um, exclamation point or question mark. And that is another thing where you can think about when you're applying some of these techniques, if that is useful for you or not. Because as we mentioned, right, some things are getting um, lost in translation. 
when you're moving it towards text. And potentially that information or that punctuation or those um, like the, the endings where you have something that is an exclamation or a question mark can provide you that additional information, right? Is it a question that people are asking? Um, is there a whole bunch of exclamations which maybe can be translated as a excitement? So those are the things that you can think about as you're uh, making the choices of how to treat your data. Cool, so next one is sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is used to systematically identify, extract, and quantify um, effective states. So basically boils down to um, a lot of positive, is it neutral, is it negative? Um, there's a lot of all additional components to it too that brings out all of the um, different emotional states. Are you happy, are you angry, are you sad? And how it's doing that is just trying to figure out all of those components and where have you, you know, is it generally a word that is happy? Is it generally a word that is um, negative or maybe it's sad? Those are the type of things that sentiment analysis tries to pick up. And with sentiment analysis, similar to the stop words, you can also create uh, dictionaries that are more specific to you. So if you had certain words um, or a number of words that uh, you wanted to basically say, okay, well, those are going to be happy or those are going to be positive. You could also do that and apply some of those um, additional restrictions to when you're doing something analysis. But overall, um, just one of the things like if you read the sentence, like the output could be a percentage, it could be just, you know, on a scale of zero to one, you can kind of play around with scales, but ultimately what you're looking for is um, some summarization, some evaluation of each word summarized over whatever uh, unit of information you're working with. All right, our last one uh, for the learning session, I think, is the topic modeling. And topic modeling is, is essentially a discovery of hidden structures in the text body. And how I think about it is like the very rudimentary uh, application is just counting words. And intuitively it kind of makes sense, right? So um, if you look at the example input and you just look at the frequency of words that are all similar, lady maybe is mentioned twice, and Michelle is mentioned twice, Obama is mentioned twice. And if you just read them and have kind of a, a very simple top three, a most frequent word as a topic, then you can say, okay, lady, Michelle, Obama. And it's like, it's not, it's, it doesn't have all of the information in this text had, but it still gives you enough to say, okay, well, this is what this paragraph would be about. Um, and there's additional applications through that will, which we um, will go into the workshop where you can have more of relationships, right? Like how often is Michelle Obama uh, mentioned uh, along or close to the words American related, right? So those are the type of things that you can then start to uh, really uh, pick up on and understand what's applicable to you and what's the business use case. Anya, just a minute. There is a question in the chat, and I think it goes back one slide. Um, and the question is, how do we know that this sentence has a positive sentiment? I would interpret it as neutral. And two slides back. I think. Yeah, actually, that was. That, <laughs> I'm glad somebody picked up on that as well. It, there's a lot of different sentiment analysis packages, right? Um, and some of them will have in, inherently a different ways to score. Like what is the reference point? So for this one, it was interesting because I would also think that it's neutral. There's nothing really for me to think about that it's like positive, but then you can also think about your scales, right? What is neutral? I mean, is it, is it positive generally? Is it saying anything that is, that is negative? And you're kind of thinking about it in terms of what are the scales and what are the applications? So even when I apply sentiment analysis, I usually tend to have multiple approaches and then even multiple packages of available and then look at the distribution of what is the scores and then try to figure out what makes more sense to me. And as I mentioned, then you can also apply some of the custom uh, dictionaries to then kind of tweak that analysis. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, 
you, if, if you guys want to, um, you can throw in the chat as well, um, some of the ways that maybe it would be applicable to have a stop word dictionary um, for your use case, for some of the things that you, you feel like would be um, inclusive versus maybe uh, additional kind of like maybe even bias towards some of the topics that you're working with. So it's just something to think about. All right, so NLP cone examples. <laughs> Fair warning, I ran this uh, a couple of days ago. If we run into anything, we can just rerun it or I'll just walk through the code. Um, I also saved it on the, uh, in GitHub. So if you wanted to pull it down and run through it, it's available. And the last one is a lot of it is from um, text mining with R. I don't know if my, my zoom in or out, I can, I can throw it in there. Uh, but a lot of it, that's a, that's a good follow up for kind of a, a little bit of early discovery into text. Um, so just wanted to call it out. All right. Oh. Can everyone still see my screen? Anya, there are a okay. couple of questions on the chat. I don't know if you want to take them now or later. Um, how are we doing on time? Should we do, should we run through? Yeah, I, I think we, we can. Um, okay. Just following up from the previous uh, question, there was a follow on that said, um, is there a specific part of the sentence that is picked up on by a classification system? And this goes back to the one that was labeled positive. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So honestly, for that particular piece is just looking at one of the packages and throwing it in there. I didn't really spend too much time analyzing why that particular score was there. I just wanted to throw an example that they can be different, right? And that's like the, the biggest component to it is that, that some of them are not gonna be intuitive and some of them are not gonna be applicable. And the packages that I've seen are like, if you actually read through like the documentation or some of the ways that they go out and score, it could be a search engine. It could be like a, a big representation of um, text that like it kind of learns to understand what is positive and what is negative. And again, a lot of that may be uh, learned on English text and might not be applicable to some other thing. But I can also take that away. I can, I rem if I remember what I used for that particular one, I can also follow back with whoever's curious. <laughs> And another question was, uh, when calculating the sentiment, does it take into account negations, something like not good? Yeah, some of them do, right? Um, and I think it depends on the application where certainly the negation could be leveraged and scored, but then you have to look at where does that, like, does that, is that output important to you, right? in the whole flexibility of it. And that's where I, I find sentiment analysis, depending on what you wanna do with it. And we can, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit um, in the example, but it really depends on what is useful to you. Because I found sometimes that you have a negation, but then it's not followed exactly by the next word that it's referencing. And therefore, yes, in summary, you do have maybe something that's a negative, but the word itself may not be intuitively negative. So you kind of wash out the meaning. And that's what I meant by like the custom uh, dictionaries where you can basically say, well, maybe you want to make it more negative, right? What are those type of things that you're really looking for? Are you just generally looking for sentiment? And if it's like maybe a social media analysis, then some of the applications may make it a little bit more sense. And then when you're getting to some of the industries, it might not make any sense because the words that you're using or the words that you're scoring are not what the general like language is, right? Like finance or manufacturing or engineering. Those, some of those words will have special meaning that once scored are not gonna give you the result back. Thank you. I think we can move on and come back to any more questions in the chat after. Okay, sounds good. Oh, cool. So we will go through um, a quick workshop just to kind of play around with the data and see some of these uh, in action. One thing that was interesting is that I, when I first started in LP, um, the some of the packages are like how you're working with text, um, the recommendations or like even some of the textbooks mention different packages or different applications. 
And just like when you're starting out, it might not be as intuitive, like which package, or you might start with one package and then all of a sudden like read another article that leverages something else and not understanding how to go between um, one and the other of how the data is put together for you to apply like the sentiment analysis. So it's just watch out for that and just look at what it inherently is being used to structure the data and whatever the functions are that you're using, just make sure you understand what the, um, like what's the object in like what form should it be in? I mean, it's not always intuitive when you're running through it and it's um, what, what structure it should be in. All right, so I hope that all of these have been uh, available or all of these ran and now we're just gonna, I pulled down by the way, um, some examples from uh, Gaggle competition so the yeah so it's airline incident safety i haven't really dug deep into the data so i'll just make some general assumptions but it's a good use case in terms of how do you form um some of your opinions and work with data that uh, may not be intuitive so again just reading some data let's look at it real quick um this is a little bit pre-cleaned from the steps but generally what you're looking at right is a whole bunch of reports um there are some parts that maybe have failed. There is some current um, na uh, natural condition or nation condition, and then some precautionary procedures. Intuitively, I'm just looking at it. Maybe there's something going on, like observation-wise, and maybe there are some things that are happening where, like, these are the items that can be done or checked. Um, parts, okay, makes sense. Maybe there's some parts that are identified, but those are the type of questions that I would start asking about the data in terms of. Is it the part that like you're replacing? Is it the part that's being replaced? Is it like, what are actually the, the information and when was this acquired? How does that information flow? So you can then form your opinion of how to evaluate it. And then you have a whole bunch of information here uh, that just describes the, the report. And the original, um, like you can imagine, right? If you just start reading one-to-one, -one, it's gonna take quite some time, right? Um, Anya, is there another screen that you want to share? Or you just yeah, want folks yeah. to look at the are you looking link? at um our studio or no no we're still seeing your uh, yeah. slides cool let's let's switch that intuitively everyone doesn't know what data i'm looking at <laughs> how about now this is yeah. good thanks okay that's the data i was explaining hopefully that's the mental picture that you have um report some part failures, a couple of uh, occurring conditions or procedures that are being done. Um, and again, just generally trying to look at it and make some form of analysis of like, what would be useful, right? I know I'm not going to go and read through every single one of these items. And maybe the request is for us to basically summarize it in a way that would help us identify the next action. So this is just fixing columns for R um, to accept <laughs> working with the column names. Um, and then this is a very interesting one right away. It's like you can think about it of, of some um, quick uh, transformations that are happening is that when you're acquiring data from Excel, maybe you're getting it from, from a database. Um, there may be some additional characters that are not visible, right? You go in there, you see in a cell, it just says X, Y, Z part but really has a whole bunch of other information, which are just spaces. And this is a way to remove that. So you don't have to, when you wanna make uh, specific changes, you don't have to like add all of those additional uh, spaces. And the next one is um, just adding an index. It helps when you're, you know, again, breaking the information down to all of those, like the corpus and the documents and um, further tokenization, then you can kind of roll it back out because not all of them will have uh, potential information or sentiment or anything like that. Um, let's go into just a quick here, quick run of just what does the data look like? Is there all of the information? This is like a perfect data set. It doesn't have any missing columns. Doesn't have any missing observations. <laughs> Almost never happens. So just something to to think about. If you did, um, that can tell you, as an example, another way for you to go and communicate with the business potentially. And just say, okay, well, from this report, we generally are missing reports for this, and maybe that's an insight. So it's almost very similar or very simple. Um, the next one is just very rudimentary um, analysis of the data um, for 
those two columns that look like there maybe are topics, right? So like if the if the question here is to kind of like summarize that text that's in the report, I'm also thinking about the business potentially and saying, okay, well, a lot of these items already look like they were classified, right? Somebody looked at that, read it, and they know where there's like maybe a drop down screen or something like that. And those are like conditions or things that people are generally seeing, right? And so maybe what's interesting is this other bucket that what naturally people may go and do is actually read to understand what's happening there because all of the other ones already give them some information. So that is just something like maybe a hypothesis that you can look at um, and then you can go to go to the business and basically share that as an observation and say, hey, did you know that majority of this data set doesn't actually have this? Is this would this be interesting or do you actually want to look at one of these components, right? Or do you only care about other pieces of information? So the process that I'm following here is just looking at the fact that maybe we do want to look at these um, other buckets and basically just saying, okay, well, what are those um, populations where we're only doing other and none and as opposed to the one that is um, everything else. So we'll just look at this population first. These are everything that is not other or none. And so then you can see, okay, the population is much smaller but then you can still see like maybe you take the next step and the next step of like warning indication might be another one you want to segment off and study by itself or maybe it's good enough to where it's not that imbalanced to where whatever implication that you or whatever analysis you want to do you can kind of draw that there and with like the one thing that you can think about right is the word frequency or some of the more introductory techniques if you have a lot of representation for the warning indicator that might be the thing that populates or that like dominates most of your results. And if the business actually cares about something else or wants insights on something else, then maybe you can potentially think about um, pre pre uh, balancing it or like not making um, a choice later down the road, but making it beforehand and studying it separately. Just some of these. And then here we can just basically say, okay, well, out of the ones that had. Uh, precautionary none or other basically majority of them are in other and again you can further segment it and say okay well we have categories here but we don't have it here let's just study that for the purposes of i just stopped here but just those are kind of uh, illustrated okay um i think i'm just making the data set much smaller in here just because um, when you start running into text and then you have your corpus and you have your documents and you have your tokens um, for sentence and words, right? You're just basically kind of increasing the problem space. And um, depending on how powerful and where you're doing this analysis, it's good to uh, free up some space. This is going to be jumping into kind of the treatment. You're going to uh, look at some of the examples before another. And this is just the limitization function, right? So before and after. Hopefully this, this runs and it's lowercase. Hopefully it's not too small on your screen. Um, but you can see that, oh, let's, let's just make sure it's, it's running the same one. Uh, go coding, coding right here. <laughs> Changing names. <laughs> okay, let's see if this works. Okay, um, these are, so the lowercase is kind of easier for, for us to spot some of the things that it was, it's treated. Um, and some of them are like crew, crow, maybe that wasn't the right application of it. Um, maybe it was. And you can kind of like look through a couple of these and see, you know, fail and failed. Like those are the type of things that are happening. Um, and again, it's applicable to your use case. I've noticed that in um, industries where you have specific language, depending on what data you have coming in, that might not be the right way. You might want to like do something else with your data beforehand. But just make sure that um, that approach applies to your data um, how you think it does and just look through some examples for like maybe uh, domain terms or something like that. And I guess just uh, some observations as I'm going through this is like what changed was it you know fitting became fit accomplished became accomplished. And again, is this change good? I think it depends, right? It, it's definitely helpful for you to disambiguate the information, but you also also have to think about the, the, the business, right? Uh, we talked about custom stop words. So the next logical thing you can say, okay, well, I 
treated all my words. Now they're lemmatized to there, at least all in the same tense. And now I'd like to remove some words that are maybe not important or not an information gain. Um, and this is a way that you can add custom stop words. So just include whatever you need. You can, uh, if you have a big one uh, or even a dynamic stop words that you constantly want to look for, what are the words that only appear once and you want to remove them all the time, you can even set it up to be more dynamic that way. Um, but literally, you just kind of plug in a, a create a variable um, that will um, go over whatever words that you do could be stop words. And as a reminder, stop words, right, are just those filler words that you might not want to see in your final product. Um, here, we're just creating a corpus, as I mentioned. Um, not every single uh, introductory NLP walkthrough will go down the corpus route. Some of them will just use like tidy text which is a lot more intuitive um, in my opinion, but for corpus and vector space, some, sometimes that's the necessary um, organization of the data that other um, like functions use or, or need, especially when we're gonna get into like counting uh, the words for some of the functions. So all I'm saying is that you might see this and you might not, you might just see something that looks more a little bit like dplyr if you're familiar with that. All right, so for example, I think I, I might have, yeah. So I integrated a little bit of a sentiment. So we're kind of, we're gonna skip from our stop words. We're gonna apply them like right after. So keep that, <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, but I just wanted to throw in here a, a quick little sentiment analysis um, with the sujet package. Hopefully this is just a very easy like way to um, visualize. You have a whole bunch of different um, documents that you have on your right, and then you have kind of like the, the scale of what words are being scored negative and what words are being scored positive. And potentially you're seeing that most of the information that got through here is not positive, right? You can also segment your data that way if you feel like that's appropriate. You can look at all of your sentiment and maybe only focus on the ones that are uh, scored negative or positive. But again, kind of from going back to that example that everyone has questions about is not every single uh, scoring mechanism will be intuitive to you. So just something to keep in mind. Um, okay, if it works. And if it doesn't, we'll just move on. Okay. All right, we'll just keep, keep going through. Um, let me see. Oh, I switched my, my data set um, size, so it's not working, but it's okay. Uh, essentially what, what you're gonna see out of it is um, kind of a, a simple plot of where all of the sentiment goes through and you can check out the, the package as well. Um, but where I would say is that it's not always as intuitive and then you can try a lot of different approaches and kind of go through that that way. Um, but even through like one of the other cool things is that once you do have something that is more linear, right, maybe it's like instead of having the, the count of uh, documents on the bottom, maybe you have like a time component, maybe you have, um, I don't know, whatever makes sense for your business. And then you can kind of say, okay, well, over that, you can kind of see the different relationship and maybe that's an input to something else that you're doing. It's just kind of different applications of how you can uh, leverage that. This is just a quick data cleaning function. This is the stuff that we were talking about um, that you can kind of think about the like the pre pre treatment of information. A lot of it you can kind of um, decide on, right? Are numbers important to you? Maybe. So maybe you don't want to remove numbers. Maybe you want to treat them separately. Uh, removing punctuation again. Maybe if something is lost in translation. If you do, maybe. Um, the the white spaces uh, that's generally I don't know um, I don't have a good like idea about why you would want to keep those um, but generally you can also think about like do you want to make everything lowercase or do you want to have some variations um, potentially you're even doing some other things uh, beforehand to understand what are all the um, what type of information you have in there and so these are all kind of I would say think about it and then make sure you understand why, like how that would change your data. And then here we're removing the stop words. Uh, for the English language, there's other packages and you can kind of quickly see what it 
what is comprised of there, right? So like you, me, do, don't, um, they, there. But again, maybe there's additional things. Um, as an example, like customer calls always start with some form of pleasantries. And you can think, okay, well, every time they say hello, maybe that's not important to me, right? And you can kind of think about removing those um, if you if you feel like I would add info or remove the unnecessary information. And this is a uh, one way to do it. Just applying the data. The other piece of it too is again when you're when you're thinking through um, some of these examples is creating a document for metrics. Um, a lot of the times that's kind of what it would be used to. In our example of like Lady Michelle Obama, where it's counting words, um, the document, remember, it's like that body of or unit of text that you're analyzing. And then what are all the words that are present? So you can kind of think about it like on one side, you'll just have all of your documents, and across the top, you'll have all of the words. And um, it counts like the, 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 the item or the information that goes in the cell. Is one of the um, like basically you can you can predefine that or like what is the weight? How do you want to evaluate it? And sometimes it'll be the frequency of it. So like how many times did you see the word? Or you can have an inverse frequency of like what's you know how many times did it uh, appear in all of the population or all of the document or all of the sentence. It's just kind of thinking about how to score um, the word unit against whatever you have. And here's an example of that, right? You have already in this population um, some of your words and then the number of times they appear. And again, we're taking all of the reports, but you can further section them off to something else. And I believe this is supposed to be the other one. Yep. So it's the, remember, there's the ones that all had the other or none, and then the ones that did not. Um, and so you can kind of see already that. The, the word frequency is different. So maybe that population um, is different. And then you can kind of start to figure out how else to, to segment that. One, one way you can quickly gain, um, like visualize that uh, frequency is through word clouds. Um, they're not always useful. They're, they're maybe fun to like react to sometimes. And depending on the packages, um, you can have the size that matters, right? So like the aircraft we saw that was one of the top and it's the biggest one here. The, the proximity to the words can also be um, sometimes an indicator of how often they appear together. It's just a little bit intuitive that if you see something here, especially like pre-cleaning or stop word, uh, if you see a whole bunch of stuff in here that's appearing or you don't understand, like I don't know what AALA is, maybe that's intuitive to somebody. I would go and find out and then maybe I'll treat that and say, well, this thing, should actually be something else, or maybe that's a quote somewhere else, and then just kind of intuitively add or disambiguate those things. Um, so topic modeling is maybe the, the last item, I believe, that we'll go over. And the, let's see, I it was very rudimentary, like pre-training for um, the topic modeling, which is, a latent virtual allocation and then um, CTM is correlated topic modeling. Um, those are kind of ones that I've seen very often used as like a starter topic modeling. And it's interesting because if I remember correctly, unlike the like frequency and the topics that you may uh, get back, some of the topics you may see are not inherently um, in that particular document. It's like looking for the topics and correlations across your whole space. So it can pick up information um, throughout to basically say, well, here's what I'm noticing. And then you can kind of bound that and say, well, I only want you to look at this population or this population. So it's kind of a, an interesting application of how it actually finds and determines what is going to become a topic. So for, for this particular piece, we're just looking at the terms that make up um, the space for LDA, panel, Z, and so like, here, maybe we could have removed some of these items, right? Because they're coming up in the frequent uh, wing, uh, door repairs. Um, I don't actually know what SRM is, but I know what light is. So those might make uh, a little bit more sense as you're starting to dive into the topics. And then there's another one, the, another application from the same package 
um, that returns a different set. So these are not actually that different. They, there are a couple of words that are not picked up by one that are picked up by the other. And one of them is more computationally expensive uh, because it's doing a lot more comparisons, but that's like generally I'll just start with a more simple one, get a little bit more of intuition and then get into the other ones once my once I'm more ready with the data, right? I can expand my data set because we're only looking at a very small subset of the original uh, body of work. I think that is probably all. And then I link the uh, this, uh, script in um, GitHub. And there's a couple of things here, maybe as a follow-up. Um, one of them is, and that's mentioned that learning or adopting a little bit more Python. And this one had a little, like a nice write-up that you can kind of go side by side. And a lot of the things that are mentioned here are also mentioned there in terms of like just pre cleaning, doing topic modeling. So if you're interested in it, you can kind of go through that and it'll intuitively make sense because it's leveraging basically different packages, but a lot of the function names and things that it's doing will, will make more sense. Um, and then if you, you know, really want to go like next, <laughs> application, you you did this, and then like you're looking for the next um, items to look at, I would look into word embeddings. Those are um, a really fun uh, area of uh, NLP where really, instead of us just looking at the available data, we're able to pass the information from some other data set into our data set. Um, and then do a little bit more of like an understanding. Uh, you may have seen an example of like, doing mathematics where you can say, okay, word king minus man, and then you ask the data set to provide you with an answer and you might get queen because it understands the relationship of the words and how things are used. In our um, example, Michelle Obama, you might say like Michelle Obama plus first lady or minus first lady, maybe you get something else. Like you're just basically trying to figure out what is the relationship between uh, king and queen, and then man and woman, maybe there's some associations that are already made. And it's also curious because when you're thinking about that, and all of the text and like everything that's available, it's learning that those patterns. And that's where I mean, like, if you jump in and start leveraging some of these things and just understanding how they work, then it may mo make more sense with how, like, why are you getting certain answers? Um, because those patterns are created by us. And so therefore, whatever we have or whatever we put in is what can be leveraged for patterns. Um, and so there's a lot of cool, like interesting things that you can um, dive into for uh, word embeddings. I'm gonna jump back to the presentation. Anya, maybe before you yeah. do that, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Let me okay. scroll back. I think there was a question specific to these, uh, to the packages that you share, the Zuzet and TextStem. And the question was if they work with um, other languages, non-English languages. Oh, um, I would check out the package, honestly, to see what languages are supported. Um, and intuitively in most, like in the space alone, um, I'll generally like you can see the community and all of the different um, packages that are available on CRAN. But the other part of it is just looking into the package and understanding what supporting languages, even like for stop words, you can say English or UD pipe has a whole bunch of different annotations. And you can just say like, which language are you looking for and which packages may have it. Yeah, I think it varies. Thanks. And then um, also specific to the uh, UZ package was that, is it built into R, I assume base R, or does it need to be installed? I assume, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that package is, um, I found it, so through my uh, exploration and by, the, again, there's a whole bunch of sentiment um, analysis packages. That one just kind of worked for my use case back in the day, and I uh, remember it having a lot of cool visuals. So if you just like put in the search engine or something like that, uh, the package uh, sujet and then the like the documentation. I think I've linked it in here as well. 
it just has like a lot more functionality it's already built in and um as i was starting out it's really cool to not like build some of those things myself but yeah you have to install it um i think it's in here when i just install packages um and just like with anything else if you just find like a github package or something like that you can just download the um the the tar gs or zip file and then download it or like put it in here that way right um versus it's the like, presentation, LP. I have a couple of examples here. Like you can just download them. LDA is some of the other ones. So you can just populate it that way or do from install from GitHub. Yeah. Okay. And another question was, is topic modeling on tweets possible or is there a minimum text count requirement? So if I understand you correctly, this is a question around the volume of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if that's the case, then uh, absolutely. There's a ton of topic modeling examples actually on like Twitter data set and social media. Um, a lot of them cover that. The only thing that I will say is that once you start, depending on where you're doing the, the work, you may consider looking into parallelization, meaning that like my laptop has four cores, but when I don't leverage all of them, that's the only space I have to process all of the information. Therefore, it's going to take me a long time. Potentially, if you have more cores or if you have like, you don't have to do it locally, you can start thinking about like, how do you speed up the process to um, to get you to the answer faster? Because some of them are more computational expensive. And then one final question was, do you consider LDA topic modeling an NLP method? Yeah, why not? Okay, that's all for now, so we can go back. Let's see if I can share back. Can go back to the presentation. All right, just make sure I'm not there. Cool, so hopefully you found some of those examples useful. They're, they're mostly introductory. Um, the tips and, and tricks basically is, again, I, I can't say this enough, but it's like all about use case and trying to apply um data science uh, data analytics anything like that a lot of the times you're doing it to solve a question right not all of it is exploratory um even if it is you're really trying to understand how to apply that in some business context and you know, even if you're doing it for fun or for yourself you're trying to like do something to so just make sure you understand that use case and then you can then like work towards that when you're um picking some of these um techniques uh, build your hypothesis, look at the data, talk to somebody in the business, um, and then do like just start small, right? Just do a couple of experimentations, look at how other um, packages are or uh, functions are performing. Um, take into consideration if you have other languages, other things that how your data is coming in and um, make sure that you understand that kind of like origin um, and processing. So that way you can then infer like, when do I get this data? How should I think about it? And then the outcome, even just topic modeling can be more actionable if you kind of put that business context there. And then uh, pick and test your NLP approaches, right? So um, the, the space is not like a, you know, if there was just one answer, you could just kind of run through everything, but it, it's all about business context and what you actually have. And Outlook. As I mentioned, I'm optimistic and there's a lot of excitement in the space. Um, it's fun. I, my opinion, but I, I think it's a, it's a lot of fun to just kind of get it to um, a large body of text that would take you like hours to read and all of a sudden you can at least start to build some intuition, get a little bit more context from the business, go back and then do some of these, um, uh, apply some of these um, techniques. And as you get like maybe the next level um, of techniques, and you can start to do things that are like even more uh, interesting in terms of finding if two things are similar um, on a number of different evaluations, if um, you can predict the next word that is going to be said or kind of like fill in the blank. There's a lot of different cool things that are happening. Um, and then if you just get, you know, carried away and you want to just go at it, uh, feel free to uh, jump, jump into more language models and um, understand how those work with the score. I think that's it. I know we were taking questions as we go, but if um, 
there's any questions or anything else that anybody wants to know. Um, I also call out that if uh, there's something more specific, I'd love for you to connect with me online. Um, if you have anything else you just want to uh, 